Mary Wollstonecraft was an amazing human being. She was the mother of Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein, but in her day she was far more famous than her daughter. I do have to say, first of all, that her name is a bit ridiculous. It's basically Mary Wall Stonecraft. I've heard of plenty of people named Thatcher or Smith or Butcher or Baker, but never a Denise Candlestick maker. Still, though, she's a deeply inspirational person. First of all, she was a writer and a historian, but she was also a political activist. She lived during the French Revolution, and while she was English, she spent many years during the Revolution in France. After seeing the reality of the Revolution, she would write an historical and moral view of the French Revolution, which dealt honestly with the need for Republican reform, but also with the brutality and the barbarism she witnessed during the Terror. In 1790, Edmund Burke, a British political theorist, wrote a treatise on the French Revolution calling for the restoration of the monarchy and defending the aristocracy, while calling for the Third Estate to return to what he considered their rightful place. He must still have been smarting just a bit from England's loss of the colonies in America just a few years earlier, but Mary Wollstonecraft wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Men in response. It was the first in a series of pamphlets refuting Burke's arguments, including Thomas Paine's Rights of Man. Mary Wollstonecraft, though, is probably best known for her work A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. It's one of those works that's simply ahead of its time, and the sort of thing that might only be able to exist in the climate of a place like revolutionary France. It argued for a number of different political, economic, and educational reforms, as well as social reforms in regards to women. It's a strange work. When you look at it with modern eyes, in a lot of ways, some of it seems almost regressive compared to where we've come to now. It was very much written with a 1794 mindset, but in a lot of other ways, it's deeply radical compared to where we've come. Her story, Mary Wollstonecraft, is a fascinating story and it takes place during some of the most important upheaval in history. It's filled with all sorts of contradictions that will make you question some of your beliefs, and I definitely suggest looking into it if it's a story with which you're unfamiliar. However, her story would eventually end, as so many did, in childbirth. She was giving birth to her daughter, who would eventually become Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley, with the aid of a midwife. There were complications in the birth. Nothing too serious, nothing life-threatening, but a doctor was called in. Famously, he hadn't washed his hands since seeing his last patient. Mary Wollstonecraft, who was healthy beforehand, became infected. She caught a fever, and she died. The messages in Frankenstein by her daughter of doctors that ignore the consequences of their actions, that play God and that destroy lives, well, those tend to become a lot clearer. The death of Mary Wollstonecraft was a tragedy, and one that could have been easily avoided, but it wasn't an anomaly. Childbirth has always been dangerous, especially before modern medicine. However, for a brief period there, when modern medicine as we know it was still in its very earliest days, it actually became far more dangerous for women to give birth. Doctors, unknowingly and unwittingly, actually spread disease whenever they aided in a birth. Women were known to write their wills immediately upon learning they were pregnant. And mothers and children died in far greater numbers than ever before, until we finally discovered germs and sanitation. But that was a problem mostly for urban European women, if you were, for example, a French woman of some means living in Saint-Dominique and you had the benefit of skilled midwives, you probably had a much better chance of survival, as did your child. Of course, those women in Saint-Dominique didn't know that at the time. For Anne Chirel, who was at this point very pregnant and preparing to give birth there in Cap Francais, she must have worried that the midwives would give far poorer care than she had received back in Brittany from her doctors. Still, though, she was prepared. She was ready for childbirth. But she wasn't ready for what was coming to Cap Francais. 
This is episode 59, The Tragedy of La Limonade. When we left off last time, Lorho de Graff had just taken an English sloop from Port Royal, off the Cayman Islands. The sloop was there hunting tortoise, reportedly, but de Graff captured her and interrogated the crew. One of the English crewmen let slip that England and Spain were preparing their first major joint venture in the West Indies of the war that had just recently broken out. I imagine Lorho de Graff holding an English soldier that he'd just run through by the collar, demanding everything he knows. Then I imagine the Englishman spitting blood at de Graff, as well as defiance. Then he tells de Graff of the impending attack, because there's nothing that the pirate can do to stop it. And then he lets out a haggard laugh until he bleeds out there on the deck. But that's just fantasy. In reality, it was probably more of a terrified fishermen, prisoners, torture, wetting their pants kind of situation. But Lord Hodegraff rushed into action when he received that news. He immediately sailed home for Petit Guave to warn the governor, Pierre-Paul de Cousset, of the impending attack on their home. The governor's response has often been characterized as brushing off the danger. You know, something like, this pirate thinks he can tell me my business? Scoff! But I don't think that's how it was. De Cusset actually took measures to prepare for the attack. He transferred de Graff from his post on Isla Avache to Cap Francais. Now, I've spoken before about de Graff's plantation as though it were in Cap Francais, and I've also mentioned the many relationships he may have made there. But that was mostly speculation. His story from here on out, though is closely tied to the city, which is why I made that speculation, but he could have had a plantation somewhere else on the island. Right now, though, we receive our first documented evidence of Lorho de Graff living in Cap Francais. This was a sensible place to put him. The city was growing. The northern coast of the island was an excellent place to settle. It had miles of good coastline and many good harbors, as well as land that was perfectly suited for growing sugar on large plantations. It was also, if the information that de Graff had received from that Englishman was accurate, where the force of English and Spanish soldiers meant to make their attack. Now, if Lorho de Graff and Mikhail André Zun hadn't moved to Cap Francais and met Pierre Lelong and his wife Anne, well, Lorho de Graff would have met Anne here. It was his job from the governor, to prepare the region for an attack, and Anne was a prominent enough citizen that he almost certainly spoke with her. Now, I still believe that he already knew Anne, and that he knew Captain Lelong. I think it's likely that he did live near Cap Francais when his plantation was attacked. I think that their interaction here in the summer of 1690 was less of a, my lady, we must get you to safety, and more of a, oh, hey, Anne, so, how's things? Oh, by the way, the English are coming. So de Graff had things well in hand there in Cap Francais. Governor de Cusset had his hands full as well. Now that the war was in full effect in the West Indies, he was busy transferring the capital to Port de Pay on the north coast of the island. It was just across the water from Tortuga, and just down the coast from Cap Francais, so... Militarily, it was a much stronger location. Not only would they be able to send out militia in defense of Cap Francais or Tortuga, the buccaneers and privateers that lived in Tortuga and Cap Francais would be able to defend the waters around the capital. De Cusset was gathering troops to him at that moment. He was enlisting buccaneers and conscripting slaves from local slaveholders and even building up a regular French militia force. You see, he had a plan. Shortly after de Graff returned home, de Cusset gathered 1,000 of those soldiers and began a march inland. He had with him 400 cavalrymen, 450 infantry, who were mostly those buccaneers, and 150 slaves. They marched through the dense jungle of northern Hispaniola toward the city of Santiago de los Caballeros. If you were to look at a map, a topographical map of the Dominican Republic, you'd see that most of the country to the west and southwest is covered by mountain ranges. And then up to the north, near the coast, there's another mountain range. 
But right in the middle of those two mountain ranges, there is a stretch of deep green. That valley is called El Ciabo, and even today it's the most fertile and economically important region in the Dominican Republic. It's one of those cities that is truly old in the New World. It was among the first settled by Europeans. In fact, Christopher Columbus himself settled the city. It's called the First Santiago of the Americas, and it's also called La Ciudad Corazon, the heartland city, or the heart of Santo Domingo. It was rich at the time in mineral wealth. The Spanish mined the gold and the silver from the nearby mountains, and then they started growing fantastic amounts of sugar and produced what was truly spectacular rum. Today, people tend to think of Cuban rum and Cuban cigars as the best, but mostly that's due to exclusivity. They're hard to get. Dominican rum, though, and Dominican cigars, both produced there in El Ciabo, are many consider the best in the world. Now, all that is 100% true. So, if anyone from the Dominican Republic's economy ministry is listening and wants to send me a box of cigars or a case of rum for that free advertisement, I would be appreciative. I also hear the chocolate is superb. But Governor Decusay intended to attack the city. He wanted to raid her storehouses of all their wealth. His plan was very much like the typical plans of the buccaneers, men like Henry Morgan, although this particular attack was better funded and better organized. However, despite that, on the 5th of July, 1690, Decusay was surprised about a mile and a half outside of town by a large force of Spanish soldiers. They held the French at bay for several hours, killing 40 of the French soldiers, and forced Decusay into retreat. The next day, when the French had finally licked their wounds and were ready to march out again, they marched out prepared for battle. They kept a sharp eye out for the Spanish army, and every man made sure that his gun was loaded and ready. But the Spanish army never materialized. It seemed like they disappeared. And, in fact, they had. The Spanish army had left the region entirely. They'd slipped away during the night, They did so to follow behind and to guard the people of the city who were running. See, all of the people and all of the wealth in Santiago de los Caballeros, well, they were on the move. They were fleeing the French. But this wasn't a disorganized retreat. This was in good order. They'd cleared out all of the money and all of the goods that were left in the city. It was clear that they were prepared for an attack from the French, in advance, ready for this. So, Decusay was able to take control of the city, but it was an empty husk. He was really unable to ransack anything of wealth, so he chose instead to burn it to the ground. Once he did, the French turned around and returned home, victorious. This was a wartime victory. So Governor Pierre-Paul de Cousset sat down to write an account of his glorious victory over the hated Spaniard. Then he sent that letter off to his royal masters back in France. Now that letter, and hundreds of others just like it, were flooding France's war ministry at that moment. See, the war, what we would eventually call the Nine Years' War, was breaking out everywhere in a much grander scale and a much larger fashion than de Cusay's force of pirates and slaves. Elsewhere in the West Indies, most notably on St. Kitts, royal navies were clashing over control of many different islands. Many of the colonies in the Lesser Antilles changed hands two or three times during just the first couple of years of the war. And then in North America, well, there were two things happening in North America— In the southern part of North America, France kept building forts in Spanish territory and the Spanish kept attacking them. But then in the northern half of the continent, what we call King William's War was going on. And that's a whole story of its own. It was what we in the U.S. call the first of the French and Indian Wars. But then in Asia, gigantic naval battles were taking place. French and the combined Anglo-Dutch forces were clashing everywhere. And these weren't royal navies fighting. These were private companies. These were those East India companies. They had larger fleets of bigger warships than any of their royal national counterparts. And they also had way more money to fund it. And 
They also had access to far more soldiers than the royal armies back in Europe. Now, they weren't French or English or Dutch soldiers, but Asian soldiers. Now, I'd like you to imagine the worst abuses of power that the British Empire committed in India. And then, I'd like you to remember that those abuses more than likely took place under the imperial crown, with the king or queen running things. The king or queen, though, had laws, and a need to look at least moderately not totally evil. Then I want you to throw all that out the window, and instead of the king or queen with their laws, make it one of the most profitable corporations in history with zero government oversight. Imagine them fighting over the richest markets anywhere in the world ever, and give them hundreds and thousands of disposable Asian troops. I want you to imagine what a war like that might look like. It was bad. But then in Europe, along the Rhine and the border with the Netherlands, a whole other kind of war entirely was breaking out. France, the Netherlands, and the Habsburg Empire were in constant conflict. Grand armies of 50,000 men, or sometimes more, clashed with regularity. Huge lines of men, as far as the eye could see, in brightly colored uniforms, stood up and shot at each other with muskets and cannons for days. That is, if they weren't being run down by units of cavalry several thousand strong. Whole cities in that conflict were surrounded with artillery and obliterated with mortars. And once they were obliterated, the rubble and the territory that went with it changed hands. The death toll during these first years of the war was catastrophic. Civilian deaths and the horrors visited upon them, well, that was unthinkable. This was a world at war. This was something that the world had never seen before. And that letter, written by Governor de Cusay, there in Saint-Dominique, detailing his group of ragtag men taking an empty city and burning it down, well, it just went on the pile. That wasn't big news as far as the war effort was concerned. Eventually, some minister would get around to reading it and make a note somewhere that Central Santo Domingo was fertile and vulnerable and ripe for conquest when they could get around to it. But at the moment, France was getting tired of winning. 1690 saw victory after victory for the French forces, and it looked very much like Louis XIV would get everything he wanted, much faster, in fact, than even he anticipated. But then 1691 rolled around. Everything changed. The League of Augsburg rallied. They took Nice and Mons back from France. The English and the Dutch East India companies began sinking whole French fleets there in Asia. St. Kitts was returned again to English control. And in Saint-Dominique, Spain and England prepared to invade. On 9 November 1690, a West India squadron arrived from Spain at Santo Domingo. There were five great warships that sailed into the harbor there. The first was the 300-ton flagship San Jose under Admiral Jacinto Lope Gijón. Then there was the 250-ton vice flagship, San Francisco Javier, and then the 300-ton San Nicolas, the Santo Cristo de San Roman, and a 140-ton French prize taken after arriving in the West Indies. This, all in all, comprised an impressive fleet. Really, it rivaled anything else in the New World, including the rest of the Armada de Barlavento. When it came to English or Dutch or even French fleets, it surpassed nearly all of them. These were proper warships, too, with full complements of guns and shot and powder. However, they were lightly manned. On these five large warships, there were only 827 sailors and officers total. That's just enough to make the crossing from Spain, and with the addition of that French ship, each of the ships was now even more lightly manned than before. However, when they reached Santo Domingo in early November, they, well, they received some unpleasant news, but that was really, to the men on board, very good news. The attack on Santo de los Caballeros had shocked the population of Santo Domingo. People from 
all corners of the countryside had heard of the French incursion and, well, they'd become frightened. They were worried that at any moment the French could invade again and attack their home. So most of them fled, and most of them went for the protection of the capital. The city was bursting at the seams. They were having difficulty housing and feeding everyone. However, with thousands of civilians flooding in, all of them fearing a French invasion, well, none of them were working on their farms, so nearly all of the able-bodied men were free to sign up for the militia and help defend their home in this time of crisis. Over 3,500 militia had mustered in Santo Domingo, and now, with the arrival of those five large, well-armed warships, the metaphorical cavalry had arrived to save the day. 2,600 men climbed aboard those warships to be handed brand new, beautiful, Dutch-built muskets, and then they sailed around the island to her northern coast. And then, 700 more, the actual cavalry this time, rode overland to secure Santiago de los Caballeros and to rendezvous with the soldiers on the ships. The two forces met at Manzanillo Bay. That is a small bay that is just about on the border of modern-day Haiti and the Dominican Republic. All of the men on board those ships disembarked, and they began to prepare for their march west. Now, I should note here that there is a fair bit of discrepancy between sources on the numbers of those Spanish forces. David F. Marley gives that quote of between 3,000 and 3,500 men, but John Latimer quotes much smaller numbers. He says that there were 200 Spanish regulars from Old Spain, 300 militiamen from Santo Domingo, 100 additional militiamen from Monte Cristi, and then a small English detachment with them. That's 700 or maybe 750 men. The discrepancy here stems from whose official figures you choose to believe. In nearly every battle in history, but especially in those that were particularly one-sided, and even more especially in those that were removed from the urban civilized world, troop numbers are almost always either exaggerated or minimized, depending on how you fared in the battle. If you lost the battle, it was, Oh, you should have seen it. The enemy armies stretched as far as the eye can see, well beyond the horizon. Must have been 10,000 men strong, and we were just a handful of old farmers. But if you won the battle, it was the same kind of thing, just flipped. The enemy army ate the countryside bare, and their campfires looked like the stars in the night sky. Every man of them was seven feet tall, and we were just one hundred men, just plucky freedom fighters. But through our superior skill, we triumphed and forced the savages to retreat. It's a lot of bluster and a lot of lying. In reality here... The Spanish forces probably numbered about 2,000 men. Some would have stayed behind to guard the ships, and some probably stayed behind to secure Santiago de los Caballeros, so 1,500 men probably isn't a bad estimate. The land forces then began to march. They rallied behind a man named Mastre de Campo, Francisco de Segura Sandoval y Castilla. Admiral Ignacio Perez Caro, the governor in Santo Domingo, well, he was nominally the ranking officer on the island. He would have been Capitan General, but that was a rank held by all Spanish governors in the colonial territories. That was more of an... well, it wasn't... not an honorary position, but sort of like a commander-in-chief in an American sense. He was... The man ultimately in command of the armed forces, every major decision had to go through him, but when it came down to actually planning military matters and leading men into battle, well, that fell to the maestro de campo, who was his immediate subordinate. They were very much, in a lot of ways, like the field marshals in the German and English armies. Now, Santo Domingo wasn't as large or as rich as Cuba, certainly not as Peru or Mexico, but it was extremely important, tactically. Plus, Hispaniola was, at the moment, 
being shared with the French. So, to be the maestro de campo in Santo Domingo was an important role. Especially in wartime, they knew that it was a place that was going to be the face of a lot of conflict. So Spain would have sent somebody there who knew what they were doing, an experienced military leader. What I'm saying here is Francisco de Segura, well, he knew what he was about. Sandoval was in command of what the Spanish call a tercio. We might think of it as a brigade or a legion or probably most accurately as a regiment. The tercio usually had about 2,000 to 5,000 men, and they were comprised of companies of about 100 soldiers each. The Spanish tercio formation was actually pretty revolutionary in Europe, and it was devastatingly successful in warfare. Now, back on the continent, basically everybody had adopted it by this point, but the buccaneers and the French militiamen of Saint-Dominique weren't so sophisticated. Those companies in the Tercio usually went into battle in a hedgehog formation. That was a square marching pattern with a piece of heavy artillery and the minstrels, the uh, trumpeters and drummers, in the center. Those were surrounded by regular infantry. In the past, that would have been swordsmen, but by this point we're talking about heavy pike. And those pikemen were surrounded by a line of musketeers. Those musketeers had their guns loaded and ready. The pike were there to reload their guns if need be, or if they were facing a charge, they could move to the front and guard them. Then there were four mobile heavy attack units at each corner of the square. Those would have been mostly light artillery, arquebus, and some dragoons for support. That was a bit of added protection that could either help defend the hedgehog formation or break off and support other units. In the Tercio, each of those companies would have marched in what they called a dragon formation, sort of a zigzag pattern. They could, from that formation, easily maneuver to either surround or break away from a combat situation. And then there would have been some heavy cavalry units, Now, in the past, they would have been knights, heavy lances, but now they would have been mostly dragoons. However, they still would have been from that slightly higher equestrian class of soldiers. That army prepared to march from Manzanillo Bay. Now, Manzanillo Bay lay about 20 miles from Cap Francais, just about the same distance as Port de Pai from Cap Francais, maybe a little bit less. When the Spanish were just about to arrive, some lookouts on the coast noticed them coming and set sail for Cap Francais to warn Lorho de Graff. After they warned him, they moved on to go warn Governor de Cusay. The Spanish, though, well, it's not like they were trying to be secretive here. They might have kept those 700 horsemen secret, but everyone else, they were broadcasting their arrival. They wanted the French to know that they were there. De Graff immediately set out to organize the buccaneers. Now, he'd been preparing for this situation for months, but now it was time. He got them all armed, and he started putting everyone in their places to defend the city. They had built a few ramparts and a few trenches, things like that. But then, perhaps most importantly, he organized the retreat for the women and children. This was the sort of thing that had frustrated him so many times in his own career as a pirate. But this retreat from Cap Francais was probably led by Anne, who was Anne Shirelle at this point. Now, that's pure speculation, but she was still a prominent citizen who had once been married to Pierre Lelong and had one of the largest plantations in the city. Now, anyone really could have been leading that, but I think that many of them at least would have looked to Anne for support. She was, though, either still pregnant or nursing a very small baby. It's entirely likely that she was in no condition to lead the retreat. However, telling you about the women and children fleeing before the battle, well, it robs me of the chance to paint a picture of Anne during the battle, going into labor. 
just as the Spanish attack, and having to smuggle her baby out of the line of fire with the aid of an Indian midwife amidst a hail of gunfire. If I were writing the movie of this story, I would include a scene like that, but we know that Cap Francais had at least a few days' warning, so the women and children in the town would have gotten out within, well, less than a few hours. But by this point, back in Port de Paix, de Cusset had received the news of the impending Spanish attack, and he sent out word to Tortuga and Leogan and Petit Guave to gather troops. They were all to send their troops out to the east, toward Cap Francais. However, Governor de Cusset didn't wait for those reinforcements to arrive. He immediately gathered all the militia forces available to him there in the capital, which was just about 700 men, and immediately set out to march. Now, he only had a very small window of opportunity here. If he were going to stop the Spanish from sacking Cap Francais, he had to reach the town first. It would take at least a few days for the Spanish to reach the town. Now, they were closer, but they were hauling artillery, so they would be moving a lot slower. He could move at a much faster pace, and, well, his men already knew the country, so they had that advantage as well. Hopefully, they could beat the Spanish there and choose the field of battle. But what de Cusset didn't know, or possibly what he just dismissed, was just how large and how well organized the Spanish force really was. He was expecting a counterattack, but he was expecting just the regular militia from Santo Domingo, with maybe a few allies from Port Royal, maybe 500 men, 700 at the very highest, but even then probably poorly armed. But he didn't account for the surge in volunteers after he attacked the Spanish, and he certainly didn't account for the arrival of that West Indian squadron with their fancy new guns and veteran soldiers to lead the army. And that's an important point. The leadership of this Spanish force was fantastic. Francisco de Seguro was an accomplished maestro de campo, and he had with him several hundred well-trained veterans to lead their militia, these were all men that had fought against the Ottoman Empire and the armies of Louis XIV. Soldiers were there to lead every unit in every company in the Tercio that had been forged in continental wars. They formed the army's backbone, and they weren't the sort of soldiers to turn around and run at the first sight of conflict. Still, Governor de Cusset was confident when he arrived near Cap Francais, well before the Spanish did. He chose to make camp south of Cap Francais, near a large, flat grassland called the Savannah de la Limonade. Now, perhaps someone out there has a better grasp of 17th century Spanish than I do, and they could help me out, but the best translation I can come up with for limonade is lemonade. Sugar, water, lemon. And... That might actually be the case. Hispaniola is a fine place to grow lemons and a wonderful place to grow sugar, so they might be well known for their lemonade, but I can't be sure about that. So if someone knows a better translation, get in touch. However, this field, this savanna de la limonade, was a good place to fight. It was wide and flat, and it had open grasslands with tall grasses but no trees. There was good visibility. It also stood between Cap Francais and the only direction from which the Spanish army could be coming. It was as good a place as any to make a stand. Now, the townspeople who were left in Cap Francais, those buccaneers who were prepared to defend their town, actually marched out to join de Cusset, led by Lord de Graff. Together, their numbers reached about a thousand soldiers. These were mostly highly skilled musketeers and buccaneers. That should have been enough. That, in any other time, could have defeated the Spanish. But this was not any other time. The Spanish forces arrived on 21 January 1691. However many soldiers Spain may have had, whether it was 1,500 or 2,000 or 3,000 or 3,500, Whatever estimate you choose to believe here, it was still more than the French had. And 
Even if they were the lowest estimate, they would have still been an impressive sight. They were marching in well-formed ranks. This wasn't a typical militia. You have to wonder if, at that moment, seeing them march like a proper European army, were de Cusset and Lord Haut de Graff finally growing concerned. So the Spanish lined up. They were still in what's been called the Spanish Square, and they prepared to do battle. Now, the French would have been broken up into probably four units of about 250 men each. We've seen the Buccaneers do this more than a few times. In the center would have been the vanguard, and then there would have been two wings to either side, fairly far out and a little bit forward. That would have given them the opportunity to envelop anybody who charged down the center, but also the ability to pull back and fight as a single unit. And then they would have had a reserve unit in the rear. Both armies stood at the ready. Their guns were loaded and well-oiled, and they waited for the command. And then, at mid-morning, about 10.30, both sides opened fire. The French Boucanyi were famous for their skills with the musket, and they were truly skilled. They fired accurately, as accurately as those muskets could, and they knew how to reload quickly. And then they fired again. They fired much faster than the Spanish were able to. This is why so many times over the past 40 years the Buccaneers had been successful over overwhelming odds. They had taken city after city and ship after ship all along the Spanish main, mostly because of their skill with the musket. That skill had made them, from Lolonet to Henry Morgan all the way down to de Graff, some of the most feared men who had ever lived. And even here, when they were outnumbered by a veteran Spanish army that was forged in the Continental Wars back in old Europe, they still managed to fight hard. However, where the pirates really excelled was at sea and in surprise guerrilla attacks to ambush their foes. All this standing up in line and getting shot at was really pretty alien to them. Still, though, they managed to hold the line, and they kept the Spanish at bay for two hours. But then, the true quality of the Spanish leadership here showed itself. The Spanish musketeers, who were standing up gallantly and firing and getting fired at, well, they were never intended to win the day. They were there to stand firm and hold the French attention. There were legions of dragoons that would occasionally ride in from the wings and probe the French defenses, but then they would pull back and retreat. They were never actually intended to break the lines. Now, of course, if they had an opportunity, they would take it, but this was a feint. It was merely a bee sting, and all it was for was to keep the French distracted. All throughout the fighting, for two hours, while Spanish and French and English musketeers fired upon one another, 400 veteran Spanish pikemen were sneaking up on them. They came in from the sides, but they were using the tall grasses of the Savannah de la Limonade to hide. Somehow, they managed to sneak in close, avoiding detection. And then, after a French volley, when they were busy reloading, those 400 French pikemen burst from the grasses and forced the French into a close-quarter battle, a melee battle that they weren't prepared for. Pierre-Paul de Cousset and Lord Haut de Graff were caught entirely by surprise. The Spanish surrounded them and broke the French ranks immediately. And then they pushed through and just started slaughtering anyone who stood in their way. It was a true rout. These were some of the best soldiers that the Spanish had to offer, and who they were fighting, well, they were mostly conscripts, fresh militiamen and slaves who had been forced to fight. It wasn't a pretty sight. Of course, the French had veterans of their own. Lord Haut de Graff and 300 buccaneers were on that field that had taken more than a few ships in their day, more than a few cities. They'd fought in many battles similar to this one. What did those combined years of experience do, though? 
What did all of that combat training tell them to do in a situation like this? Well, they ran. They ran as far and as fast as they could. Almost all of the 300 buccaneers escaped, including Lorho de Graff. Now, Lorho de Graff was a prime target of the Spanish attack, so the Spanish were annoyed and more than a little bit upset that they failed to capture or kill him. Still, though, they captured plenty of other men. The French officers, including Governor Pierre-Paul de Cousset, well, they were all killed. And during the battle, as many as 500 French soldiers were also killed. There were only 200 men left to be taken into custody as prisoners of war. Spain only lost 47 men. The French would call it the Battle of La Limonade, but the Spanish called it La Victoria de Sabana Real. Now, if you were to Google Sabana, which I may or may not have done here, it comes up with bedsheet as the translation. Now, my grasp of the Spanish language is, well, it's not great, but it's better than my French, but I just couldn't figure out what bedsheets had to do with this battle. And then there's Real. Now, if you Google Real, it will give you real, which I know in this context isn't the case. In 1691, Real meant royal in Spanish. Now, today they would more likely translate that regio, especially when dealing with a, a monarch or the crown. But Real was a possessive form of royal, as in the royal council or the royal lands. So, victory of the royal bedsheets? Hmm. That's when it struck me. I'm dealing with a language from about 1700. And the English language has changed a huge amount over that time, so so must have the Spanish language. Sabana in 1700 was cognate with Savannah. And in fact, it still is. It still has that same meaning, but Savannah has just become kind of archaic Spanish. Today, they would probably more likely use words that we would use, similar to prairie or meadow or grassland. So, the victory of Sabana Real was the victory of the Royal Savannah, the King's Field. It was Spain's way of saying that on this day, on these grasslands which had been discovered by Christopher Columbus and settled by Spanish conquistadors 197 years ago, it was saying that they defeated the French interlopers and reclaimed those lands in the name of the king. You see, this was a real Spanish army. This wasn't some ragtag militia force that wasn't paid and had guns that were half rust. This was a true fighting force. If the Spanish and the New World had ever had these numbers or ever been this organized before, they could have easily defeated any of the buccaneer forces that went up against them at Maracaibo or Veracruz or Portobello, anywhere that the pirates had attacked in the last 40 years. However, they hadn't. But now, well, this was a major victory for Spain. It was a victory both in killing Frenchmen and reclaiming land, but not only that, it was a, an emotional victory a moral victory. It was proving that the French buccaneers were not, well, they weren't devils, they weren't immortal, they were just men, and men could be killed. Over the next few weeks, Spain would have her way with French Hispaniola. They would immediately sack and burn Cap Francais. Then they continued on west. They attacked Port de Pie and Port au Prince. They razed both to the ground. Defenses were attempted in both cities, and smaller battles occurred, but there was really no question as to who would win. They were hopeless affairs. Luckily, the Spanish had other places to be, so they moved on before they attacked Tortuga or Petit Guave, and most of the inhabitants of French Hispaniola had escaped to those cities, or some of them had left the island entirely. If, before the battle, as soon as they realized that the Spanish had landed, Lorjo de Graff had marched his men west and met with Governor de Cusay. 
they might have been able to make a stand elsewhere. If they had abandoned Cap Francais, which they should have done, it was an outpost to them. If they had waited on their reinforcements to arrive, maybe they would have been able to double their numbers and possibly repel the Spanish. Still, it's unlikely, but they would have had at least a better chance. The aftermath of the Battle of Sabana Real was difficult for the French. Many men had been killed that day in the fighting, and those men weren't pirates, as so many of the people who have died on this show were. They're not men who went to sack and burn. These were farmers. They were fathers and brothers and sons and husbands. Joseph Charel was killed in the fighting at La Limonade. His wife, Anne, had made it to safety. She was probably still pregnant at this point, but might have had a small child. This was the second time that she had been away from her husband, with a baby to think of, when she learned the news that her husband had been killed. I can't imagine that. It would be terrible enough to experience that once, to feel the fear and the sorrow and all of that uncertainty, and the anger. To be alone, again, with a tiny human to care for, and living with the threat of constant danger, and no reassurance. In both cases here, in the death of Pierre Lelong and Joseph Charel, both of her husbands, well, they had been killed by the Spanish. What does that do to a person? What could it turn someone into? What could it drive them to do? Next time, we'll find out.